Sex education in China today is World AIDS Day. And the United Nations calls for more sex education. China needs to provide more sex education to youth to ensure the health of the young people, who are critical to the country's future. For more about the sex education in China, I've talked with Guo Ruishang, UN Women Project Officer. Children from disadvantaged backgrounds do less vigorous physical activity Children from disadvantaged backgrounds and certain ethnic minority backgrounds, including from Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds, have lower levels of vigorous physical activity, according to researchers at the University of Cambridge. The patterns mirror inequalities seen in levels of childhood obesity, suggesting a need for a greater focus on the promotion of vigorous physical activity, particularly for those children from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Over the past four decades, the global prevalence of childhood obesity has increased tenfold. Obesity in childhood is associated with illness and early death in adulthood, so tackling childhood obesity is increasingly a public health priority for governments. There are also widening inequalities in obesity prevalence. By age 11, UK children from disadvantaged families are three times as likely to be obese than more advantaged children. There are also stark ethnic and racial differences in levels of childhood obesity, with higher rates of obesity within certain ethnic minorities including children from Black African, Black Caribbean, Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds. Evidence suggests that more vigorous intensity activity, such as running or swimming, is more strongly linked with reduced waist circumference and body fat than moderate intensity activity. International guidelines say that children should engage in moderate to vigorous intensity activity for at least 60 minutes per day. When we look at overall physical activity we don't see clear differences between children from different backgrounds despite clear inequalities in obesity, says Rebecca Love, a Gates Cambridge scholar at the Center for Diet and Activity Research CEDAR, in the MRC Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge. To investigate this further, we looked at whether overall physical activity was hiding inequalities in the intensity with which that activity is performed that might explain these patterns. The researchers studied data from almost 5,200 children aged 7 years who were part of the Millennium Cohort Study, a longitudinal study of children born in the UK between September 2000 and January 2002. The children were given accelerometers and their activity measured for a minimum of 10 hours for 3 days. The results are published today in the journal BMJ Open. The team found that the higher the level of education attained by the mother, the more minutes of vigorous intensity activity her child was likely to have, accounting for time spent in moderate physical activity. Children with mothers with high levels of education accumulated three minutes more vigorous activity per day than those with low levels of education. Similarly, the team found significantly more time spent in vigorous intensity activity incrementally with increasing household income. Intensity differences were also apparent by ethnicity. White British children perform on average more than three minutes more daily vigorous physical activity in comparison to children from Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds. Children from other ethnic groups also accumulated 2.2 minutes fewer daily vigorous intensity activity overall. It is suggested these differences are relevant on a population level and changes to reduce differences in vigorous physical activity could have population implications for inequalities in adiposity in UK children. The differences were consistent in both boys and girls. There are clear differences in the amount of vigorous physical activity a child does depending on their socioeconomic and ethnic background, explains senior author Dr. Esther Van Sluys. Although individually, these differences are small, at a population level they are likely to make a difference. Changes to reduce existing gaps in vigorous intensity activity could help reduce existing inequalities in levels of obesity in children. The team say that there are many factors that might explain the differences, including access to or the cost of participating in sports activities, and a parent working longer, inconsistent work hours within a low-income job. There may also be differences in home and family support for physical activity between ethnic groups. Children from different backgrounds can face a number of barriers preventing them from participating in sports or other types of vigorous physical activity, adds Dr. Jean Adams. We need to find more ways to provide opportunities for all children to get involved in vigorous activity. 
The research was funded by the British Heart Foundation, Department of Health, Economic and Social Research Council, Medical Research Council, and Wellcome. Additional support was provided by Gates Cambridge. Cancer-fighting combination targets glioblastoma researchers have paired a specialized diet and a tumor-fighting drug and found the non-toxic combination helps to destroy the two major cells found in an aggressive form of brain cancer, the team reports in the online edition of the Nature Group journal Communications Biology. The international team combined a calorie-restricted diet high in fat and low in carbohydrates with a tumor-inhibiting antibiotic and found the combination destroys cancer stem cells and mesenchymal cells, the two major cells found in glioblastoma, a fast-moving brain cancer that resists traditional treatment protocols. The ketogenic diet and the antibiotic 6-diazo-5-oxo-L norleucine, first characterized in 1956 and referred to as DON, offer a non-toxic therapeutic strategy that could be used to manage the deadly brain cancer, said Boston College professor of biology Thomas N. Seyfried, a lead author of the paper with Boston College senior research scientist Perna Mukherjee. The researchers, probing a treatment modeled on evidence that glioblastoma is primarily a mitochondrial metabolic disease driven by fermentation, discovered the combination was able to penetrate the blood-brain barrier that shields the brain from both injury and interventions, they wrote in the article, titled, Therapeutic Benefit of Combining Calorie-Restricted Ketogenic Diet and Glutamine Targeting in Late-Stage Experimental Glioblastoma. We were surprised that the restricted ketogenic diet facilitated delivery of DAWN through the blood-brain barrier, said Seyfried, a lipid biochemist and author of the book Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, Wiley, 2012. It appears from this study and our previous study with another drug, that the restricted ketogenic diet can be considered a novel drug delivery system for the brain. There is no drug known that can do this. The team from Boston College, Harvard Medical School, Berg LLC, Venezuela's Zulia University, and Hungary's University of Budapest, studied the diet drug intervention in mice that serve as the closest models to glioblastoma in humans. The carbohydrate glucose and the amino acid glutamine are the two major fermentable fuels in the body that can drive the growth of glioblastoma, as well as most cancers, Seyfried said. Yet relatively few studies have simultaneously targeted these fuels as candidates for therapeutic management of glioblastoma. In a report last December, Seyfried and colleagues identified glutamine fermentation as the missing link in the metabolic theory of cancer first posited by Nobel laureate Otto Warburg in 1931. Contrary to the theory that cancer is determined by genomic instability in the nucleus of a cell, the metabolic theory of cancer holds that cancer's deadly path begins in the mitochondria, where cells generate energy. In their new study, the researchers administered DON, a glutamine antagonist, in concert with a calorie-restricted, ketogenic diet to treat late-stage tumor growth in the brain. DAWN targets the biochemical missing link, the reaction glutaminolysis, while the ketogenic diet both reduces glucose and elevates non-fermentable and neuroprotective ketone bodies, Seyfried said. The diet drug therapeutic strategy killed tumor cells while reversing disease symptoms and improving overall mouse survival, said Seyfried. The therapeutic strategy also reduces edema, hemorrhage, and inflammation. Moreover, the calorie-restricted ketogenic diet facilitated DON delivery to the brain and allowed a lower dosage to achieve therapeutic effect. In addition to Seyfried and Mukherjee, co-authors of the study include Merrick A. Domin, of the Boston College Department of Chemistry's Mass Spectrometry Center and former undergraduate researcher Zachary M. Auger, Michael A. Kibish of Berg LLC, Rodney Bronson of Harvard Medical School, Gabriel Arismendi Morillo, of Zulia University, Venezuela, and Christos Chinopoulos of the University of Budapest, Hungary. Glioblastoma is an aggressive primary human brain tumor that has resisted effective medical treatments and interventions for decades. The current standard of care combination of surgery, chemotherapy and radiation treatment offers to a median life expectancy of 15 to 16 months, often with debilitating side effects. The findings support the importance of glucose and glutamine in driving glioblastoma growth and provide a therapeutic strategy for non-toxic metabolic management, said Seyfried, who has been searching for alternative cancer treatments throughout his career.
Seyfried said next steps to further explore the combination would be to determine if the diet drug therapeutic synergy found for glioblastoma could also be seen for other malignant cancers, as glucose and glutamine are the key fuels that drive most if not all malignant cancers regardless of cell or tissue origin. A gut check for heart failure patients Heart failure patients who consume more dietary fiber tend to have healthier gut bacteria, which is associated with reduced risk of death or need of a heart transplant. The fiber study was presented today at Heart Failure 2019, a scientific congress of the European Society of Cardiology ESC. Our gut microbiota is composed of trillions of microorganisms that have the potential to affect our health, said study author Dr. Christiani Meyerhofer, of Oslo University Hospital, Norway. Previous research has reported reduced biodiversity of microbes in the gut of patients with heart failure patients. Today we show for the first time that this is related to low fiber intake. The study also linked meat intake to higher levels of trimethylamine N-oxide TMAO, in patients with heart failure. Prior research has shown that increased TMAO levels are associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular events, and that gut microbes play a role in its formation. We show an important pathway that connects diet, microbial activity, and cardiovascular disease, said Dr. Meyerhofer. It would be prudent for patients with heart failure to limit their meat intake to two to three times a week. To conduct the study, the investigators recruited 84 well-treated patients with chronic heart failure and 266 healthy people. The composition of gut microbes was assessed by sequencing the bacterial 16 srRNA gene in stool samples and compared between the two groups. Heart failure patients had lower biodiversity of intestinal microbes than healthy controls, with differences in the two main phyla of bacteria present in the human gut. Patients with heart failure had a lower ratio of Firmicutes bacteroidetes, FB, compared to controls, and this difference was even more pronounced when the cause of heart failure was non-ischemic. Dietary and outcome analyses were performed in heart failure patients. Patients who had a heart transplant or died had lower biodiversity and a lower FB ratio than controls. Regarding diet, bacterial diversity and Firmicutes levels were positively associated with fiber intake. Our findings suggest that the altered microbiota composition found in patients with chronic heart failure might be connected to low fiber intake, said Dr. Meyerhofer. If these findings are confirmed in future studies, my advice will be to choose foods high in fiber such as cereals, fruits and vegetables to stimulate a healthy gut flora. We are still just in the beginning of mapping and understanding the microbiota, how it works, and its potential for the clinical setting, noted Dr. Meyerhofer. She is currently involved with GutHeart, the first randomized controlled trial on the effect of a probiotic and an antibiotic on the composition of gut bacteria, heart function, and inflammation in patients with heart failure. Point two, the trial will show the potential clinical effects of modulating our gut bugs in the setting of heart failure, she said. How interval training affects belly fat in obese 70-year-olds By today's estimates, one-third of adults aged 65 or older are obese. This growing obesity trend, along with the decrease in our level of physical activity as we age, seriously raises our risk of diseases and death. We know that aging leads to a gradual decrease in lean body mass LBM. Put simply, LBM is the entire weight of your body minus the weight associated with fat tissue. As we age, fat distribution in the body can shift, and often increases in the belly region. This is a health concern for older adults, because so-called belly fat also known as central obesity is associated with a greater risk for heart disease than general obesity. Now, a team of researchers have designed a study to learn more about the effects of a 10-week, easy-to-perform, personalized, progressive vigorous intensity interval training among 70-year-olds with belly fat. Their study was published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. The researchers recruited participants between January 2018 and February 2018 from the Healthy Aging Initiative High, an ongoing study conducted in northern Sweden. In the High, all of the 70-year-olds in the area were invited to participate in a free health survey. To date, 68% of the eligible population agreed to participate. The participants who were assigned to the exercise group participated in a 10-week-long progressive exercise program starting in February 2018. 
The program consisted of short, supervised training sessions, performed in a group setting, three times per week for 10 weeks. The 36 participants were taught to perform body weight training exercises with minimal use of equipment, at first for 18 minutes, alternating exercise with rest periods in a ratio of 40 20ths, for example, 40 seconds of work and then 20 seconds of rest. The participants worked up to a 36-minute training period as their training volume gradually increased. 36 other participants maintained their daily living and routines throughout the study and served as a control group. The participants were about 70 years of age, and about an equal number of men and women participated. Participants in the exercise group decreased their fat mass by nearly 2 pounds and gained about 1 pound of lean body weight compared to the control group. The researchers concluded that 10 weeks of vigorous intensity interval training improved body composition in older adults with belly fat. Those in the exercise group saw a nearly tripled decrease in their total fat mass compared with participants in the control group. The exercise group also saw positive effects on total lean body mass. The doability of the exercise program was reflected in the high attendance rates 89% for the training sessions. Interestingly, however, the exercise significantly decreased belly fat in the men but not the women who participated. It's likely that more research is needed to explain this finding in greater detail. Overall, the researchers suggested that the easy-to-perform exercises, designed to fit a home environment without the need for expensive gym equipment, may be generalized to other settings and groups of people.